Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith, and um, I'm going to continue my discussions on how the stratosphere interacts with the troposphere. How changes in the stratospheric polar vortex, for example, uh, when it's um, disrupted by sudden stratospheric warming events, you know, very rapid and extreme warming, how it can then feed back and affect extreme weather events on the surface of the Earth, so in the troposphere. And also, uh, by the same token, changes in the troposphere, for example, the jet streams changing location so that they're driving over topography, for example, the Tibetan Plateau will then transfer vertical upward momentum to these horizontal high-speed ribbons of air, and that can penetrate into the stratosphere and disrupt the stratospheric polar vortex, which then feeds back and affects extreme weather events on the surface of the Earth. We don't talk about these things very much, and there's a lot to learn about these, but I'll talk about uh, a recent paper um, that uh, discusses some of these uh, connections. So this is the paper. Um, you can Google the title and find it yourself. Um, but I'm trying to explain the key things. And the key things is that there's three large scale features in the stratosphere. There's the stratospheric meridional overturning circulation or, or the Brewer Dobson circulation. Okay, so that moves mass from the tropical to the extra tropical stratosphere, and it does it in time scales, long time scales, months to years. There's a quasi biennial oscillation or a periodic a switching of the uh, wind directions as you get descending easterly and westerly equatorial jets driven by the tropical waves, the Kelvin waves or the Rossby waves. And you also, we also have the stratospheric polar vortex, which is the circumpolar westerly jet. It forms in the autumn, peaks in strength in the winter hemisphere and decays again in the spring. It's strongly modulated by vertically propagating planetary scale waves. So an example of these uh, planetary scale waves would be the jet streams going over mountainous terrain, getting a vertical component, going up into the stratosphere, splitting the polar vortex. So, <clears throat> you know, that would be a vertically propagating planetary scale wave. Um, this, so planetary uh, size, size wise scale, scale, the scale is on the size of the planet, planet, very large wavelength waves. And that can lead to rapid changes. For example, a sudden stratospheric warming, SSW, which the polar vortex winds, they rapidly slow and the polar stratosphere warms. So I showed you uh, in a previous video an example of how this is the polar vortex before. So we're talking about minus 80 degrees almost in this region, uh, minus 40 in this region, westerly jet, westerly jet, one huge spinning vortex. And then once that was split by, affected by a sudden stratosphere, sudden stratospheric warming event, we ended up with four subjets and temperatures above zero at 10 hexapascal. You know, so high up in the stratosphere, very, very warm temperatures. And of course that, as you can imagine, that has huge disruption on, um, on uh, feeding back into uh, events on the Earth's surface. The, the, there's also the polar vortex can also intensify and cool in these strong so-called vortex events, which is the opposite to a sudden stratospheric warming event where it cools and increases in strength. And that also affects things on the surface. Um, and there's the Brewer-Dobson circulation, which I was talking about. Um, and that affects the amount of water vapor that that enters the stratosphere, which then drives uh, impact surface climate through radiation changes. And the QBO was another effect. And, you know, there's a lot of different things that can go on, but let me show you the, the key results. The key results are after we get a sudden stratospheric warming, it affects the temperatures at the surface. So this is the mean temperature surface anomaly. Okay, so you take, uh, so what this is, is this is, a, these are the differences or anomalies between the composite of the 30 days following 24 observed sudden stratospheric warming events and the composite of and randomly sampled 30 day periods from December to April. Okay, so what it does is it looks at what happens from the st sudden stratospheric warming and you see you get a warming over the, over the uh, you know, here's Greenland, over Hudson's Bay, 
over the Canadian archipelago, a large warming, you know, up to 2.4 degrees Celsius over this region, and you get a cooling minus 2.4 degrees Celsius over northern uh, Asia and Europe. And you also get a cooling um, in, in uh, more mid-North mid America here. So you can get huge snowstorms coming up here. That happened in 2017, 2018. This is the coldest temperature anomalies and you get similar patterns. And this is the warmest temperature anomalies and you get similar patterns, okay? So, so uh, very, very strong effects on weather patterns like temperatures, cold outbreaks, warm outbreaks, and extreme weather events when we have this sudden stratospheric warming. And this is uh, some, some more data, some more images showing what happens. There's also effects in the southern hemisphere from the sudden stratospheric warming in the northern hemisphere. Sudden stratospheric warmings rarely happen in the southern hemisphere, although they, they have. 2003, there was a strong one. The reason they don't generally happen in the southern hemisphere is because it's mostly ocean. So there's not mechanisms to turn the horizontal moving jet streams, giving them a, get, to give them a vertical component, which will, which will allow them to penetrate up into the stratosphere and split the vortex, causing the sudden stratospheric warming. Okay, I think that's the, the main reason. So here's what we see after a sudden stratospheric warming. We get cold extremes in, in Eurasia, Europe and Asia. We get warm extremes over Greenland, over the Arctic sea ice. So that affects, that melts more of the sea ice, causes Greenland melt. We get marine cold outbreaks a bit lower down here. And we get some cold areas further down in North America. We can get some of these huge storms coming into to Europe. So we also get uh, dry spells in some regions and flooding in other regions, flooding in the Iberian Peninsula, for example. Uh, because there's a strong co contrast between temperatures, you can get extreme winds in the region between these temperature uh, divisions here, the warming and the cooling. You get extreme winds in this region and clusters of storms coming into Europe. And in the Southern Hemisphere, cold spells on the Antarctic Peninsula and in parts of Argentina and heat waves um, in this part of Antarctica. And dry, so dry spells also over Antarctica, drought and wildfires over Australia and increased convection in the, in the Pacific here. Wet spells uh, associated with the cold spells in South America and a weakening of the surface winds over Antarctica. Okay, so all of these sort of things are what we see. So this is the, um, you know, this is this is a very good chart here, and it shows, you know, in the northern hemisphere, tropics, and southern hemisphere, what happens. So when we get a sudden stratospheric warming, then we get the marine and cold air outbreaks over over the uh, over this region of the North Atlantic, okay, and. Uh, we get increased storminess in southern Europe and we get regional sea ice changes in the Arctic, okay, from these sudden stratospheric warming events. When we have the opposite to the sudden stratospheric warming, so the polar vortex in the stratosphere gets stronger, a strong vortex event, then that can cause storms in northern Europe and the North Atlantic and droughts in southern Europe affecting agriculture. When we get, sometimes we get a wave reflection. So you can get a, uh, the jet stream directed upwards sharply. Now, instead of breaking into the stratosphere, it can be reflected back down and that can cause cold air, break, air outbreaks in North America. The QBO, the quasi biennial oscillation in the tropics that changes the Madden-Julian oscillation, which is where the rainfall happens on, um, along the equator in the direction of the winds. So it changes, uh, gives you precipitation extremes in the tropics of subtropics. We can get atmospheric rivers uh, leading to flooding in Western North Africa, North America rather, okay, California flooding. Changes in the monsoon in India and Southeast Asia from the QBO effect. So there's global effects of, of this, not surprisingly. Um, early vortex weakening can cause different things. Heat and drought in Australia and Antarctica, cold spells in Southeast Africa, South America. 
and also you get ozone anomalies. What you need you, for the ozone destruction, you need very very cold temperatures and and uh, in the upper atmosphere. And they're you know they're they're there in over Antarctica. So the ozone thing is normally an Antarctic thing. Although in 2010 I believe it was a severe we had a severe ozone hole in the in the Arctic um, because the atmosphere was extremely cold. So we had uh, you know when you get a sudden stratosphere sudden stratospheric warming, then the ozone breakdown stops. So you get these different anomalies that have different effects in, in, in the uh, southern hemisphere. So this is a good uh, map here showing you surface extremes and impacts associated with stratospheric precursors. So all of these events so, so are on the, that happened on the surface, these extreme weather events, can be associated with changes in stratospheric conditions before the event. So the wildfires in Australia, for example, the hot spell in Antarctica, record low sea ice in Antarctica, okay, A atmospheric rivers um, it com coming into uh, California, for example, into North America, cold air outbreaks, extreme ice loss, storm clusters, extreme rainfall, heat waves, heat waves spring of 2020 all over this region can be associated with changes in the stratospheric, stratospheric drivers. So this is very, very good information, uh, key information that is not talked about very often. And uh, yeah, so basically that's the, those are the key uh, factors from, from this paper in this, in this chart. Okay, so also, um, yeah, so these, these are things that are very important to, to, uh, to keep in mind. Um, that uh, you know, we we really don't talk about the the what's going on in the upper atmosphere and the stratosphere so much in terms of weather and climate and extreme weather events. So they're they're tied in a lot, and I'm sure I'll be covering this topic in a lot more detail uh, as we move into 2021. So this is uh, you know this is the this is the equator, summer pole, winter pole, the Hadley cells. Okay, and the feral cells and the polar cells, and this is a tropopause, you know, about 17 kilometers at the equator, uh, dropping to about seven kilometers, eight kilometers at the poles. Um, you can have movement of air up into the stratosphere carrying water vapor, and this is the Brewer Dobson uh, circulation here, um, carrying water vapor up here, and uh, you know, you, you also have the uh, polar, uh, you know, you get the winds generated in the, in the, you get the jet streams occurring here between the Hadley and Farrell and Farrell and Polar, okay, on, in both sides of the, in, in both hemispheres. And you also get the contrast causing you the uh, polar vortex in, in the winter, okay. Uh, also, you know, the Brewer-Dobson circulation you know, here's a, here's a this is a PowerPoint slide explaining the details of the Brewer-Dobson circulation. Um, so here we have the tropics, um, we have the equator, winter pole, summer pole, and you get these different interactions between air movement from the troposphere up into the stratosphere in the so-called Brewer-Dobson circulation. So here's here's another example. You have tropospheric ozone here. You get the updrafts here into the stratosphere, the Brewer-Dobson circulation, and uh, you get the trace gases and water vapor and stratospheric ozone here, okay, um, and other various processes happening. Um, and this is uh, about sort of about the history of the, uh, you know, this is about the history. So this is Brewer working for the UK Met Office under supervision of Dobson during World War II. They wondered why high altitude aircraft left condensation trails and that research led them to finding uh, this, this uh, circulation pattern, this Brewer-Dobson circulation, which then becomes very important for, um, for what we're trying to uh, examine now. Um, so, di so in a recap, so, you know, I could go on and on with more info here, but in a re in recap, we get the polar vortex split into multiple vortices in the sudden stratus forming, and it has huge impacts to extreme weather events on the surface as well. Thank you for listening.